Hey everybody and welcome to this video that's about Warno versus Wargame deck building or whatever it's going to be titled. If you know my channel, you know I tend to ramble. I'm going to try to keep this as short as I can, which is probably still going to be like 20 or 30 minutes. Hopefully not more than 30. At the bottom you should see in the timeline, you know, the chapters and whatnot, so you can jump ahead in the third or fourth chapter, how many ever this is going to have if you are only interested in certain things. But before we actually get into it, I want to get a few things out of the way. First and foremost, I'm going to come from a gameplay perspective, right? I don't care too much about historical accuracy, realism and all that. And if you do, and you prefer certain things over others for that reason, then I can't really convince you. And that's not my goal as well. For one, I just want to explain my point of view and maybe that of others. And two, if you come from a gameplay or whatever perspective yourself, maybe I can convince you or not, or at least, you know, also try to explain my point of view. That said, most notably when it comes to Red Dragon, I would say that my opinion in that case is a bit closer to the truth, if you want to call something like that the truth, than someone who has like 50 or 100 hours, by which I'm not trying to say their opinion is invalid, but I would say mine is quote-unquote more qualified. At the end of the day, we're talking about video games. And you know, you don't hear me rambling about Seal Division 2 balance either, because I barely played that, and that's why I don't really talk about it, or specifically about its balance. Um, and before you say anything, I'm not under the illusion that there's going to be like huge changes about Warner stack building. At the end of the day, I'm just a guy, and it's just my opinion. And even if I, if I was someone important, I don't think Eugene would still change it. Um, I'm pretty sure still, uh, divisions and most of the systems are here to stay. But for one, you never know. And secondly, maybe there's going to be World War Two or whatever. We'll see. Um, and. Of course, it is still worth mentioning that in Warno, not all units are in yet, especially Toad units. But I, I still think we got a reasonable, a very, very good look at how it's going to shape out in the future as well. And a lot of the things I'm actually going to talk about aren't really affected necessarily by the amount of units. And, you know, if you want to call those things solutions, or even if you want to say Warno's deck building is problematic, the quote-unquote solutions don't have to look that way. I'm mostly here to say what I think is lacking or missing or just not as good. Uh, at the end of the day, it's up to Eugen and, yeah, Eugen to decide if those truly are problems, if they're big enough and if they need solving. And, you know, if they need solving, how to solve it. It's obviously completely up to them. I'm not under the illusion that I'm kind of some kind of savior or gonna... Eugen should do it exactly like I want, right? So don't get me wrong. Now firstly, I want to briefly talk about why I even made this video. The reason for this is actually a Reddit post, um, which is actually a very, very similar kind of discussion that even goes back to Steel Division days, which is always, it always ends like this. You know, there's one side that says there's absolutely no deck building, they should go back to nations, and the other side is, screw that, divisions actually have variety, in Wargame you always saw the exact same 2% of units, and 90% of the units are useless. At the end of the day, and I know I'm gonna sound like an, ooh, look at me, I'm the enlightened centrist, but realistically speaking, the truth kind of lies somewhere in between. You know? Now, let's take a look at Red Dragon first. Just as an example. Because if we take a look at the Soviet deck, there's actually a lot more variety than you might think. Especially in the support set, for example. If you vote, and if we want anti-air, you have like the prime choices. There's like four prime choices. Man, six even. You have the Book M1, the Tor, the Osa AK, the AKM, Tunguska, and Tunguska M. The Osa AK is your cheap, but quite effective, mainly focused on plane AA. AKM is your all-rounder that's fast and also affordable. Tor is your all-rounder that is just a bit more high-end, but also a bit more squishy in the sense that it isn't wheeled, even though it has armor. Book M1 is your heavy anti-plane focus A that, even if it doesn't kill it, at least stuns. Tunguska is your more short-range all-rounder, but it's incredibly deadly if you get into its gun range, and the Tunguska M has more range. Um, the base Osa is your cheap opener anti-helicopter AA. We can also like one-shot six HP helicopters, which you will frequently side, uh, see on NATO side. 
right? There's a lot of choices. Straight after them is not even too bad. But of course, there's also a lot of not so great choices. The video user and Shinika aren't so great. The straight up 1M, meh. Base book, of course, not so great. But these are all viable choices. There's a lot of choices. Smirch, very good in team games, not so great in 1 vs. 1s. Jurgen, very good. Mr. Fine, Malka is good. Peon is fine. Burotino, of course. Motors, while they're, none of them are amazing, they're all viable choices. Okay, SVK probably over the base, Nona, but I think you get the gist. Very, very similar thing with a tank tip. Everything below the T62 line is viable. On the other hand, all these T55s, all these T62s are pretty bad. Okay, the MV1 might be good in like a team, uh, sorry, armor deck. The BMP685 is actually kind of nice, but they're all garbage. Don't get me wrong, right? I'm not trying to say every unit is perfectly viable. Don't get me wrong. But I think people underestimate how much variety the, a lot of the units are. Uh, have. A lot of the decks have, excuse me. And then, I'm not trying to like call this guy out or something, or try to get him flamed or bullied. But if I read, if I read, if I see you, sir, I know it's an Aquila opener, I'm, again, I, I'm not gonna try to come off as condescending, but I am gonna come off as that. Your opinion is either dog shit or you're only playing clown games or always against the same people. The last time I heard people seriously complain about Aquila openers was like in 2014 or 2015. Here's a good old K50 plus K52 unstoppable combo. Or uh, Israel Patton plus Super Heavies. I'm sorry, nobody opens with the patents who is, you know, actually serious about a game outside of like every now and then or some meme games or something. This is just, stuff like that is just very easy to punish. So, like, sorry, but that's just not right. Um, and that's just when it comes to, like, unit variety. And, of course, you know, some decks have more variety within them than others, like Red Dragons, of course, just being dog shit. There's, there you'll always see the exact same units because they, so, they only have a handful of units that are actually good. Um, but even when it comes to deck variety, right, because a lot of people always bring up for one, oh, in Wargame, you always see the exact same decks. After they said you see the exact same units. And they use, and some might say, well, sure, divisions might not have as much variety within them, but you have a lot of variety between divisions and a lot more viable divisions. And that, frankly, I just can't comment about, because it's mainly about Steel Division and Steel Division 2, which I didn't play as much, so I don't know much about the balance, right? But talking about Red Dragon, at least. Especially currently, I don't think we had any more variety in decks, right? All of these decks, Barra Dragon, are viable. Both in team games and 1 vs. 1s. Commonwealth, okay, maybe not in 1 vs. 1s, but everything here is viable and strong. And you can easily get very high rank, do very well in tournaments. Just recently I got wrecked by Landjude when playing on Taunt Mech, which is, in my eyes, the strongest deck in the game. Right, And I lost with it. So it's not like I'm, you know, if it was free, uh, some kind of, you know, Guy who only cares about, you know, oh, I'm the best at the game, I wouldn't say that Untaunt Mech is better than Lanchard and lost against it. <laughs> Different story, right? All these decks are viable. Of course, you have a lot more nations than just these coalitions, but the coalitions are at the end of the day formed from these nations. And then US, you know, in and of itself is very viable, so it's USSR, of course, which isn't even listed here. But they're all viable, as viable as they've ever been, right? Sure, up until the South Africa DLC, no, Eurocore stood a lot more out. These decks stood a lot more out, right? But they all got a bit more broad in line. And yes, at that point, the meta wasn't really that great. But you also have to take it into account, right? Up until the South Africa DLC, we almost had five years of figuring the game out. Of course, after such a long time, people know which units are the best, which decks are the best, which are the weakest. It's been five whole years, right? Up until like two years ago, or even one and a half years or something ago, I would laugh at people if they said they would take Baltic Front Modo over Baltic Front Anspec. And then General Boulanger comes ahead, or goes ahead. While I'm not saying he's the first one to use it, don't get me wrong, but he clearly popularized it by just bullying people in ranked, including me, with it. And I'm like, god damn, this deck is a lot stronger than I thought. So even after all those years, while... Uh, there were probably people, there definitely were people who realized how strong it is, and I knew it was strong, but I always th thought Baltic un Unspec was stronger. There's still some changes here and there. Even though everyone, or a lot of people, thought we figured the game out. 
Um, it took people over half a year to really realize how strong Eurocorp was, because all those buffs they got came with Israel DLC, really, when the IV rebalance came, making the AMX 10 OP. And the Tiger had been unchanged for basically years, and only then people realized how absolutely broken the stealth on it was. And when I say people, of course, I mean like on a, let's say, whole player base thing, right? As always, there were individuals who realized it earlier than others, but it always sometimes takes a while until the majority of the player base, or, or it really comes into the meta. Um, even when, and then even when going back to 2016, around the Dutch DLC, the meta was actually quite balanced, reasonably balanced. It wasn't amazing. Um, sometimes people say it was only Commonwealth and Eastern Bloc, but I'm like dead certain that if that meta got more time than just a few months until Israel released, it would have shaped out a lot more varied than a lot of people think. However, like you matter, there's a big but. It doesn't mean that there are, you know, aren't a lot of useless units. As I've said, all the Soviet C-55s and basically all the T-62s, except maybe this one, essentially useless, right? There's plenty of useless units, right? My point was just that there's a lot more viable units than people think, which is not necessarily the same thing. But at the end of the day, it still doesn't mean they serve no purpose, you know, just like there's essentially useless specializations, like, um, we don't talk about ships, but airborne is mostly a meme, support, and marines, with ex a very few exceptions, kind of a meme as well. But you can still, like, ro just like, you know, why, why you might choose to play Poland over Eastern Bloc, you might, like, roleplay or do the nation-only game, something like that. So they still serve some kind of purpose if you're into these things. So it's not like they're completely useless. But yes, if you're talking from a meta and tryharding perspective, there are plenty of quote unquote useless units, but I think a lot less than people think. Which still doesn't mean that, you know, I think 90% of the use units are perfectly fine, right? Um, but I think you get the point that I'm trying to, come, that I'm trying to express here. But, as I've said, I don't think it's just about the whole nations versus divisions thing, I think there's a lot more that I'm missing from Warno. And for me, the biggest thing is infantry training. I brought this up briefly, but um, let's actually go into... Let's get into this. Let's boot in Jerstack. In Wargame, of course, there's not just veterancy. Veterancy, of course, still exists in Warno. It's a bit different. In Wargame, it also affected DPS, though, on a smaller scale it only affected accuracy really you could argue it affected that you know dps in the sense that they're more stress resistance yada 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 but i'm gonna leave that now it's more survivability you got accuracy you know don't ignore the numbers they're kind of wrong but especially at higher efficiency you got quite the bonus which of course you get in warner too but in warner you also get better fire bonus and all that but it was just one part of the whole calculation if you want to call it that you also had a training stat here if you'd never seen more game here at the bottom over stealth training elite. From a, a loadout perspective, Falschmega are actually very, very similar to Jaeger, which are just regulars. One is a G3, one has an MP2, but same Panzerfaust, which has actually the exact same stats on the unit card, and MG3, which is actually quite different. But one, shock upwards got CQC. Every shock infantry has CQC capabilities, meaning they can fire in the same town block, but also more accuracy more stabilizer. And if you look at primary weapons, so I'm gonna compare shock, which is one level above regular. In this case, the exact same loadout. The primary weapons also better accuracy and stabilizer, and that ignores the veterancy level, by the way, but also a higher rate of fire. And another thing is, the better the training, the, more, the better your speed. And of course, you pay more. Now what this meant is, similar to high vet units in Warno, they're obviously more effective and in a sense more survivable, both from a morale and stress thing, but of course also speed. But what this also meant is that, in a sense, the game forced you, if you choose certain units, how to use them. But from the get-go, it made them more varied. Because if you, if you look at, if you had these units, just like that, with uh, Warno, veterancy and training thing, means the training is gone. They presumably have the exact same veterancy levels, so both cost 15 or 20 points. 
have the same base stats on all their weapons. And the only thing that affected their DPS essentially was the veterancy level. But it also means it costs the same. And then you have like Panzergrenz in the Martyr, or effectively Panzergrenz in the Fuchs. That would be the only difference. You wouldn't suddenly have a unit that is a bit more deadly by base, even if they come with the same veterancy. Or, and it was faster and thus more survival. You couldn't like suddenly have a much faster, more mobile, but also more expensive squad running around the map and stuff like that. Sneaky, freaky, whatever. Um, and at the end of the day, you have to keep in mind, against fire support, artillery, tanks, IFVs shooting at them, they still take the exact same damage. So it's the survivability comes through their speed and knowing how to use these expensive squads. Because at the end of the day, it's still a risk. You can't really use them as frontline infantry. Sure, you could, but... If you go up against a deck with a lot of fire support, they're gonna die just as quickly as Jäger, and you lost a lot more points. But have inherent different roles. Whereas, if you take a look at, let's say, the East German Falschmigger and East German Motritzen, while there are some differences, you can take them both on Elite. Oh, that's the wrong division. <laughs> you can take them both on Elite, of course. But their loadout is incredibly similar. The same RPG, they have the same speed. Don't the... They even have the yeah, same man, same amount of men here. You trade one MG for one AK and that's it. Of course, Falchmega currently can forward deploy. But... I'm gonna take that out because I feel like that might get adjusted. But from a purely gameplay perspective, and it's not the only unit that kind of is like that, they are practically very, very similar. Motrids are basically even stronger because MGs are better than uh, assault rifles, and you pay 10 points for that. Point balance, whatever, that's a whole different story. But I think you get a point. In Wargame, if you had the same, let's say, loadout, the Falchmaker would have more accuracy base, ignoring veterancy on the primary, more high rate of fire, more accuracy on their MG, be faster and be more expensive, even if they have the exact same loadout. Thus, the Falchmaker would already have a different role because for frontline, where you meet a lot of fire support, not as efficient, but you can use them a lot better for sneaking around, right? The Mordschützen would be your all-rounders, and if you had line infantry version of them, you wouldn't really use them for sneaking because they're way too slow and way too easily stunned and all that. And on their own, just not nearly as strong to deal with, you know, single units that might be defending the flanks and such. You just don't have that here. So in short, only really the equipment and mainly if you force mainly maybe sorry if you're forced into transport choices, only that really affects infantry's role, which might be enough in some senses, but I feel like that deck building, if you also have different training, you would have a lot more trade-offs and a lot more choi practical choices, right? Another example is if you look at Fifth the Panzer, I think this is kind of egregious even, but I don't wanna like be too whiny here, let's just delete this so we can yeah. Look at Pan Pioneer Armbrust, Panzer Grenzen, the M113, and Jäger. They all have one MG3. Of course, every other German squad also has one MG3 if they have MGs. And, you know, respective to the HP number, the amount of G3s, primary weapons. So, eight G3s, nine, and ten. In this case, both have the Panzer Faust 44. In this case, Armbrust, which is very similar except to the RPM, one less AP, five percent less accuracy. But the way they actually play is just exactly the same, and they, you know, they even pioneers, they're supposed to kind of be different. And they have the same veterancy levels as well, except for the Jäger. And the Jäger are essentially the same as Heimatritzen, except one higher veterancy level, because reservists get, like, no veterancy, which is a penalty. If I take the Olsen lead, they're except exactly the same as the Olsen lead, which, of course, if they're both regular in Wargame, would also be the case with the same loadout. But if, let's say, the Panzergrenz were shock, and of course, they would also come with higher veterancy, but they also also cost more, be faster, have better primary weapon stats, better MG stats, but also be more expensive. So again, there is this trade-off, but we don't have this here. Here, they're basically the same. And while you have this differing HP mechanic, I feel like that's just not really that different because now, if you want to take an IFV, you're forced to take a low HP squad, which makes it cheaper, but you also take the more expensive transport. But you don't really have the choice of, hey, do I want to take the squad in a cheap transport or an expensive IFV? Because if you want to take them in a cheap transport, you're probably going to take the high HP squad anyway. Because then they're more survivable. I feel like that's not really a 
significant kind of deck building choice or trade off because it's not like you can choose to take these ones. In the, it's not like you can choose to take the high HP squad in, in an IFE or the low HP. No, you don't have the choice. If you want an IFE, you take low HP squad of the same squad that you already have in high HP. If you even have the choice in the first place. So I feel like that's not really suddenly a new mechanic. What we have is, of course, leader buffs, but again, while this mechanic, first of all, I don't like it. I don't think it's particularly impactful from a gameplay perspective, but of not to be ignored, don't get me wrong. But I think it even less affects your deck building thing. I think it might affect like, hey, I'm gonna take my tanks at low veterancy and then plan on buffing them to the higher veterancy level with the leader round. And that's basically all it affects in terms of deck building, in my eyes. Now, that was the whole infantry and training and whatnot thing. The other thing that I'm missing is old equipment. We kind of have that in Warno, in a sense, with like the Panzer Division, where you have. Let's make actually go into the armory. We have like all those C55s and maybe some T72s. But you know, the other thing is with the whole realism and authenticity thing, well, they always, of course, would fire the newest ammo, so all the T55s have the same AP. All the T-72s have the same AP. You have some armor differences, but that's it. So, like, it's not like you have a whole lot of choices, right? Even East Germany in Wargum had, I think, two or three more tanks. Like, there's a T-70. Actually, did they? Maybe they didn't. But I think you get the point. The tanks there played a lot more differently. And then you had coalitions as well, and that's a whole different story. But then you take a look at the other German division. And you have no T-72s even. And take a look at the 3rd Armor Division, and you get two tanks. You get two tanks. You get the HA and the M1A1. That's it. For tank division. If you play an armored in war game. One second. In war game. What does armored mean? In war game, armored means... Sure, you lose access to some units. Let's take... Uh, it's not just like unspec for the sake of it. I guess it's kind of unfair because it's like a whole blue for units, but let's just say US. It means sure, you lose some units, you don't get Patriot, you don't get your Delta Force, you don't really get any wheel transports, you don't get your Marines. But suddenly what it means, you don't actually get that many more heavy tanks, sure you can fit more in, but it suddenly means, hey, of course, they come with high veterancy, it affects your veterancy, which it doesn't really, at least yet, in Warno, maybe they're gonna adjust that. You get more, which means you more cards, which means you could take more in higher veterancy. But it also means, hey, your low tier tanks, maybe your US M M48, is a lot more viable. Hey, you get this on Elite suddenly, it's now a much, much better choice. US, you don't really notice it all too much, but, you know, stuff like Centurions, lower tier Leopards, these M48s, suddenly all loaders become a lot more, uh, a lot bigger threat because the accuracy bonus has been like made up for, right? Tanks are a lot more sturdy, stuff like that, right? You get, you make up for your lack of, for your weaker infantry, your slots, or a lack of something else by having more choices in terms of tanks. You really play different gameplay, whereas in Warno, I feel like Third Armored plays like a mech deck with only expensive tanks. And you have the choice of lower veterancy, uh, low tier stuff, right? And the same goes with infantry in Wargame. You have the choice between Modus Strike, which get a low tier RPG 7, and Modus Strike 90, which get an RPG 7 VR. I would really like to see this in Warno as well. Why not? I mean, I know the answer why, but it's a rhetorical question. Why don't give us Modus Strike and, like, Modus Strike 75, which carry an RPG 7? And the reasoning for this, I don't know. Well, they had old RPG rounds for practice purposes or something like that, and then in case of war, we might as well use them. I don't know. Make something up like that. And surely there's, like, a somewhat kind of reasonable explanation. Even if you don't want to get give the third armor a, a M1IP or base M1 because they never fielded it, although there's probably still stretches. Or let's say M60s or even M48s. Why not say, hey, they had old rounds to practice with, let's give them another two or three HA Abrams cards or M1A1 Abrams cards with lower tier ammo, older ammo, right? It's the same ammo as an L44, so surely there's some older ammo available as well somehow there, 
after all, they're stationed in Germany, and it's a German gun. If there's all their ammo available for it, surely they could have an M1A1 with like 15 AP or something. Why not? Make something like that up. There is, there are, from my, am not even amateur perspective, ways to reasonably explain stuff like that. That's what I have to do. You literally two tanks available in third armor, an armor deck. Come on. <laughs> so yeah, I would really, really like to be a variety like that, and it doesn't really need new models either, right? And it, you know, allows a lot more trade-offs in terms of do I want low tier infantry for like spam or something, or high tier infantry for like high tech that you know one or double types of tanks is much bigger threat in that sense. That's what I'm missing. And it kind of goes back to like the whole variety thing, but I think like that's different than choosing from variety through a whole sna whole nation's arsenal. The other thing that I'm missing is of course the fact that infantry weapons should be less standardized. But I think they are planning to differentiate them a bit more. I think they all wanted to have like a somewhat level playing field and then work upwards because right now AK-74s, M16s and G3s have the exact same rate of fire stats. The only thing that's different is, is the G3, for no good reason honestly, has more damage, more accuracy. It's a basically an objectively better assault rifle than compared to the M16. All you do is like, lose a bit of stabilizer, but you get like almost one third extra accuracy and uh, of course one tenth higher AG, which is really stupid in my eyes. And once again, it's a different story, right? Or people have been asking about the whole 84 with the US, which again, I don't know if, you know, I don't want to say this rightfully or wrongfully, but we don't have Mac rifles long and Mac rifles. 84 for like 70 points, which is more or less the same score, but 84, now we have a trade-off. We can actually choose between the two. And if we now had training on top of that, one can dream. I think you get the point I was trying to bring across, right? There's not just variety through a whole nation's arsenal, but variety through like older equipment, training, and having different veterans and mechanics as a result, right? And I don't feel like HP has a significant impact. Whereas I think almost all the time if you had the choice, if all else is equal, I think you'd rather choose mag rivals than fire team law. Because mag rivals are so much stronger against infantry as well and actually survive a whole lot. Um, and I meant fire team dragon and fire team law. I kind of find it funny how they cost the same, but there's a 15 point difference, so they probably should be more expensive. Even. So actually, maybe currently why choose these? Anyway, let's not talk about this. Um, or I guess Engineer's Dragon, which are 10 men, right? Why would you choose one over the other if you just want a cheap dragon? Anyway, different story, let's uh, move on. I don't want to ramble too much here. Now, at the end of the day, I'm not saying it needs to be a copy of a dragon. What I'm trying to showcase here is what we had in Red Dragon, that was left out, quote unquote, compared to Warno, but not really replaced by anything, was just left out. There was there were systems that added variety, and they just got thrown out of the window at the end of the day. How you can, you know, introduces a lot more variety in deck building and whatnot. I don't care as long as I like it. I'm just showcasing that what we had in Red Dragon, it was proven, it worked. I don't think it was perfect, but you could have always just taken this as a base and improved upon it, instead of just not using it at all. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I, I, I know that they taken this from Steel Division, but I don't see how it was significantly improved from there either. They still have like the same 3 level, or I guess now 4 level, but that's the whole lowest veterans level option thing is different. Or 3 star, 1 star, 2 star, 3 star, or no star. A veterancy level that they had in Steel Vision as well with very similar bonuses and they didn't do anything on top of that. it. I don't think they suddenly added another layer on top of it. They didn't. They just simply didn't. Now, going into the last short part hopefully, are there any realistic solutions to this? Maybe bring back training, although I don't expect them to. Um, it's I think quite a lot of effort, and you also had to like readjust unit cards and whatnot. Um, what about expanding the veterancy levels at least, right? So you wouldn't 
be as easily be able to let's say get Mortress and Fudge Maker on the same veterans level, expand them to five levels or something. So you can't easily so elite squads are actually elite and you know Mortress and squads you can't get on elite. Um, although the people some people I know don't really like that. What if for deck building you had to choose two divisions to build your deck out of? Of course you'd have to significantly adjust you know availability and cards and what you actually have available, and it would be a bit diff more difficult to balance unless you predetermine which two divisions can go together. But that could be a way. Again, I don't expect it, but, you know. What if, and that has been brought up many times, and I'm definitely not the first one to bring this up, what if you got detachments from other divisions, right? So you kind of have, like, a tag for units, similar to a prototype tag, where if you choose a detachment from another division, you get access to their units as well, minus their prototypes, for example, or a certain number, or a certain package of units. I don't know. What if you go the whole route with uh, the 8th Infantry Division, who gets German units, which as far as I understand from the blog posts and whatnot, were not in the 8th Infantry, but they are essentially taken from like a reservist thingy bomb that was in the area of where the 8th Infantry was uh, stationed or whatnot. Why not take this a bit further? Why not do this with every division to make them fill their holes? Not necessarily fill their holes, but make them more varied, right? Why not just Add units from nearby battalions, platoons, divisions, other divisions, regiments, batteries. Look, I don't know these terms, if you haven't noticed yet. I don't know my shit around this, but there probably are ways, right? It's still a fictional scenario at the end of the day. I'm not asking for, like, alien te uh, uh, technology or anything like that, right? Uh, I'm obviously still asking within reason of the whole authenticity thing. And of course, at the end of the day, does it even have to be solved? Is it a problem in the first place? I'm not... No, for me, it is, in a sense. But I'm not saying it objectively is a problem, the whole deck building thing. Um, I just think that there virtually is no actual deck building, which is why I don't really think there is a need to make a deck building video on how to build a proper deck. There's not much you can do wrong here, in all honesty. So yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, what about Warner 2? If there's a Warner 2, and... What if Eugene actually is looking for ideas to improve upon? I don't expect him to. It worked out for them in Steel Division. Yeah, I'm just speaking my mind here. Obviously, I'm not alone in this. I'm not saying, I, you know, quote unquote, we or people who hold this opinion similar to mine are in the majority. I don't know. I don't really care too much. Because at the end of the day, it has, it's up to Eugene to decide on if they want to do anything and if they do, what they would do. Just throwing out ideas and also explaining as to, you know, what I think is just simply lacking. In any case, 32 minutes, longer than I anticipated, but still shorter than the previous take I had on this. I re-recorded this, actually. And I hope that at the end of the video, I didn't come off it like this, but maybe more like this. You know, just an old grumpy man who has played way too much war game. Um, yeah. Hope you enjoyed it if you watched this far, and I'll hopefully see you next time. Bye-bye.